Rahim, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Peace, blessings, and mercy of Allah to whom all praise is due be upon you and upon his Prophet. I'd like to thank the organisers of this conference for giving me the chance to speak. I'll point out to our moderator that I was told I was to speak for 20 minutes and not 15, so I may have to go through at a very fast gallop. And please jump on me and whack me over the knuckles if I take too much time. My topic is on Islam in Australia. It's from a somewhat different perspective to previous speakers. This is a little bit of a walk through history up until the present day. And it's a brief history, its current state and its challenges and prospects. Or in other words, the good, the bad and the ugly. Whoop, what's done? I've got to go back. Have I? Yes, okay. I'm not an expert at using one of these things. That's it. Okay. Good. Well, I talk about history. We go back not to 1770 when uh, James Cook discovered Australia, but 500 years to back to about 1517. That painting up on the top right is of a Macassan prow. It's an Aboriginal rock painting. An identical one to that has been dated by radiocarbon dating back to the year 1517. So we've had contact between this part of the world and Aboriginal communities in Northern Australia for 500 years, at least 500 years. In other words, contact with Islam. They came down, if you see the diagram on the left, on the trade winds to uh, fish for trepang and trocar shell, which upon their return back to Macassar, they then took up on a trade route up through to China. This was part of a trade route which formed a maritime silk road between Yemen and China dating back to about the 8th century. So Islam's had a large presence in this, presence in this region for over a thousand years. Um, this is a sketch of some Macassan prows in Raffles Bay, northeast of Darwin. They were well reported upon. The trade went for many years Yep, whoops, why am I going backwards? That's it. Many years um, until the British eventually stopped it. They found they couldn't regulate it, they couldn't make money out of it, so they made it impossible to continue. Uh, this shows just an Aboriginal diagram of a Macassan smokehouse. Some more sketches of their, what they're doing. If you go up into northern Australia, everywhere you find a tamarind tree is where a Macassan has camped. This gentleman on the uh, far right there is a man called Pong Basu. He's a proud captain who was met by Matthew Flinders, the first man to circumnavigate Australia in 1806. That man had been coming to Australia since 1770 when Captain Cook discovered it. So there's a long history of discovery of Australia and not by Europeans. Okay, have I got, okay, next slide. A few other things. Their culture, Macassan culture and Aboriginal culture intermingled very much. Uh, you can see these stone pictures on the far right there and up here in this diagram here. They're cross sections through Macassan prows. The Aboriginals actually laid these out to teach their children and their people what the Macassars were about and basically how to work with them. So there was an interchange of ideas. Um, up on the, let's have a look. You'll see some words up there which you probably can't read. Macassan words came into the Aboriginal language. You see, for instance, Balanda, meaning Hollander, for a European. Uh, Rupia for money. Gula for syrup. So basically, Bahasa infiltrated into the Aboriginal language and the Macassars also took some Aboriginal words back with them. There were intermarriage between Aboriginal communities and the sailors. Uh, sometimes they'd have wives in Northern Australia and wives back, back home because they spend months in Australia and months back home. Uh, to get down to that blue and white painting up there, that's called the Barwu. It's a symbolic representation of a Macassan prow sail. When the Aboriginals had to make claims for land rights 
up in the northern part of Australia. And in this case, for maritime land rights, they were able to go back on the traditional culture, which is an oral culture which describes this interaction with the Macassan traders. And they were able to use the songs and stories in their oral culture to lay claim to their tribal lands. And they now use that symbol to mark the maritime boundaries of their land. So this relationship was very significant to them. Um, you hear one man, for instance, and I haven't got my glasses on, so it's very hard to read. These here Macassan people, very good start, real good friends. All the Macassar bring it here, friend, brother and sister, uncle, nephew. Not they bring trouble, not anything, because they're looking for the Ripper job, meaning Trapang. That is the story from the beginning. Two story, different, true story, different from Captain Cook. Macassar people come here, they are friends. So the relationship is very good. In fact, when the Macassars sailed back on the trade winds, the Aborigines used to mourn their passing. They had a ceremony which was equivalent to a mourning ceremony, mourning the death of a relative. And they'd also have a welcoming ceremony when they came back. Even the religion has, even the religion of Islam has infiltrated the Aboriginal language up there. They have a godlike figure, a supreme being, which they call Walitha Walitha, or some people translate that as Allah. Allah. They use terms such as, oh God, I can't read this, Allah, Allah, Sila, Muhammad, Muhammad, Silali, which, and in one of the prayers ending with Suri Makassi. Now, Suri Makassi is obviously Tori Makassi, but other people translate those previous words that I said as Lapi Lahapi Lana Muhammad Rasulullah. So there's been even an infiltration of religious beliefs in amongst the Aboriginal community there. So it was a very much a positive thing for them. Now, let's have a look. Next one. Then it went downhill when the Europeans came. As I said, they stopped that trade. Europeans, Muslims came out on the first and the second fleets and they have ancestors today who can trace their ancestry back to the first and second fleets and they're still Muslims. Um, much of the European exploration of this region relied on the Casas. They were local Muslim seamen who could navigate and run the ships through this part of the world. Very early Dutch maps of this part of the world are clearly derived from Muslim maps. Why? Because some of the maps have things like New Guinea upside down and Muslim maps used to put south at the top of their maps. Europeans not knowing this kept the north at the top convention and put things in upside down. Okay. Next. As you can see, as I said up there, there's some, they've had Muslims who settled, became farmers and so on. Some of them also brought out as convicts, of course, because Muslims like to give their uh, colonial masters a bit of trouble and the colonial masters like to uh, move them to other places. South Africa, for instance, has a very large Cape Malay community when the British moved out their troublemakers and I believe the Dutch probably did too. Okay, we move along to the Afghans. Australia wanted to open up its desert regions and its more remote areas. And some had, someone had the brilliant idea, we'll bring out a bunch of Afghanis, mainly people from the northern part of the Indian subcontinent, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Balochistan and so on, who were experts at handling camels. And basically much of central Australia was developed by Afghanis carrying goods and water and food and so on on the backs of camels. You see there the grave of, I think it's Dost Muhammad, who died in about 1903 or something like that. But he died at the age of 37. He came out in about the 1870s, I think, from memory. You can see some Muslims praying on one of the ships coming out. This is what the camels look like. Very typical decoration that you often see in that part of the world. The first mosque in Australia, the Mari Mud Mosque. Mari is a tiny little town in the middle of South Australia. It has two great claims to fame for tourists. 
the rebuilt mud mosque and the Maori man, which is a large Aboriginal man carved into the bush. They had a pool at the mosque for, for ablution and the story goes they actually had fish in that for meat as well. The Muslim men, the Afghani men, were not allowed to bring their wives out, so they married into the Aboriginal community. And we have people in the Aboriginal community today who have Muslim names. So their ancestors still, their descendants rather, are still around today. Um, they also married European women who are euphemistically called widows, but many of them were actually European prostitutes, but I suppose you could say they made honest women of them. So look, what else do we do? They were responsible for exploration in Australia, the first expedition from Melbourne to the northern part of Australia by Burke and Wills couldn't have taken place if you see the two people framed in green without Afghani cameleers handling the camels. There's the two cameleers, Isan Khan and Baluchi, or Dost Muhammad. Sadly for Burke and Wills, they thought that they knew everything, left the camel handles behind, I think. Where was it? That, uh, basically halfway on the journey, I can't remember the exact location, but they left their camel handles behind, headed off into the great unknown. Because they didn't know how to look after their camels, they died, the camels died, and so did they. And when they went to look for them, guess what? They took another load of camels with more Afghani camel ears to help look for them. This time they found them. <laughs> Unfortunately, these people were out here on contract. When their contracts finished, some of them became hawkers, taking uh, vans with, with products around them, you know, like bolts of cloth and saucepans and kitchen utensils and various other things around to outback properties. You can see one there. The picture up the top, up there, is that's my mother's hometown. She was born in 1918. They did not get a water supply in that town till 1905, 13 years before my mother was born. Water was bought 580 kilometres on Camelback from Perth by Cameliers. Unfortunately for them, when their contracts expired, they were supposed to go back, many of them didn't, so they passed as illegal immigrants with a reward for them. There are two Muslims in that poster, the rest are all Sikhs, and if you look closely at the top, they're classed as being Chinese. So Australia had been and still has now a bit of a paranoia about the Chinese coming down to take over Australia. <laughs> so. They built the Adelaide Mosque, a very Afghani style mosque, if you note the minarets. Sadly, they lost the use of this for quite some time and they had to go back to the National Trust in South Australia to get back the use of it as a mosque. There's a couple of the, the Khan brothers from Alice Springs, Aboriginal descendants of the Cameliers. The Ghan train runs from Adelaide to Darwin. It's a 58 hour train journey. It's built in memory and named after the Afghani Cameliers who laid down the railroad, which eventually replaced them. The woman down the bottom here is Hannah Fadeen. She's the descendant of Afghani Cameliers and a well-known Australian author. Her book, Their Caravanserai on the Experience of Migration by Muslims to Australia, is really worth a good read. It has some very interesting and quite amusing stories. That's the good, the sort of ugly, when Australia hitched its flag to the British ensign and joined Britain in World War I, and Turkey came in on the side of Germany, these two gentlemen, Badshah Mohammed Gul and Mufti Abdullah, or Mullah Abdullah rather, decided they had to defend the Ottoman Caliphate. So they hitched up their ice cream cart, put the Turkish flag on it, grabbed their guns and went out to a pile of rocks along the railway line between Broken Hill and Mutwinji, where people would go on a Sunday for a picnic and they ambushed the picnic train, 
killing four people. Now this was the first shot in, the, in World War I against Australia. It was basically, these guys were engaged in a war, yet they were hunted down, charged with murder and executed. But that's about the only sort of bad memory from that time. But it's an interesting story. <clears throat> Moving along, when the pearling industry started up in northern Australia, Malays were brought down to work in the pearling industry, and generally in pearl sorting, seeding pearls, working as divers and so on. And they made a very significant contribution to that industry. However, that has a bad side to it too. The people who ran the industry decided the Malays were too expensive, so they brought in Japanese pearl divers and immediately decided they'd cut the Malays' wages from £12 a month to £4 a month. And the Malays did what every good unionist and worker does, went on strike. And they eventually negotiated a wage of £10 a month, but they still weren't satisfied with that. So what happened was the powers that be rounded up the Malay ringleaders and deported them. One of these guys here, who is... Oops, missed him. Going, got him. Samsuddin bin Khatib was one of the leaders. He was rounded up and deported. But during World War II, he joined the Australian Army, those whose enlistment papers. He became a commando and served for 199 days behind Japanese lines, reached the rank of non-commissioned officer, but none of that stopped them from deporting him. His service to Australia was not appreciated. Oh, good five minutes, okay. Moving along to the present day. 30, 39%, I can't read my own slides. 39% of Australian Muslims are born in Australia. That's not quite as many as the percentage of people who have at least one Australian born relative in Australia, but a significant portion of Muslims are born in Australia. The largest two ethnic groups in Australia are Lebanese and Turks. Uh, Lebanese dominating Sydney, Turks dominating Melbourne. We have quite an array of countries. That certainly doesn't represent the diversity, but it gives you a good idea. More recently, we've had arrivals from Iran, Iraq, Syria, uh, Central and West Africa, and so on. A substantial number of Bosnian Muslim refugees as well. They say Muslims don't integrate. I think half that, that's a bunch of schoolgirls playing rugby. We have at least one Muslim woman's touch rugby team and a Muslim woman's Australian rules football team. And they are a very good team. And there is even now interest among Muslim women in playing cricket. So sporting-wise, which is the national religion of Australia, Muslims are definitely well and truly assimilated or integrated, whichever way you want to call it. We're the largest emerging religion in the country at about 2.6%, slightly ahead of Buddhists. But if you notice, the actual largest emerging religion in Australia is no religion, about 30%. And that's a particular problem for Muslims as well as young people tend to wander away from the religion and become detached from the mosque. 604,000 Muslims in Australia, 12 million Christians, and have a population of 23.5 million. 71.2% of Australian Muslims have a completed high school or tertiary education. More Muslim women have tertiary qualifications than Muslim men. That compares to 56.1% of all Australians having completed high school or university degree. So as a whole, we're better educated, but we have higher unemployment rates because of discrimination. In terms of education, we now have a thriving Islamic school network. We start to have its ups and downs, but it's still thriving. Most religious education still takes place at the mosque, but we now have 
what you would call tertiary education institutions for local, more advanced Muslim education, but there's still quite a lot of Muslims do go overseas for further study. Mosques or planning problems. That's not a mosque. That's a market which held 10,000 cars in its parking lot. One community tried to build a mosque near this for 5,000 worshippers. Too big, out of keeping with the proposed development in the area. But it's okay to have a market looking like a mosque. There's, of course, the Toowoomba Mosque and Sefton Mosque, which is also firebombed. Under council regulations, if you buy a place of worship, you buy the right to use it as a place of worship. The locals took Sefton Mosque to court. They bought a church and used it as a mosque, which is quite legal. The locals took the mosque to court and the judge ruled that Muslims don't pray like Christians, therefore they are not allowed to use it. However, the outrage from that was so great that the government brought in a new law allowing them to use it. So we do have some wins. And the ugly. That's laughingly called the Australian Patriot Front, protesting against the presence of Muslims. This is a protest about the development of 